see, Sandlot time. Okay, welcome in. Yeah, you can kind of see him, but it's not that great. Coach Grant in the house. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the same lot. Yes. Your lighting's way better than mine. Oh, man. I've got that California sun coming through. Uh, welcome, Coach. It's good to see you. I just want to uh, pin a comment here so everybody knows who I'm talking to here. Uh, Sandlot with Coach Grant Achilles, who has not had a baby just yet. Not yet. Oh, man. Brown University. Folks, you're in for a treat today. Um, with Brown University, and I'm going to pin that, and boom, awesome, awesome, awesome. Coach, how are you? I'm great, thanks for having me. Absolutely, thanks for joining in. We've got uh, YouTube fired up as well, so people can hear you and see me, but uh, go to Instagram Live if you want to see us both. Um uh, this is the virtual sandlot. This is kind of what um, uh, I've been doing with my afternoons to, since the quarantine started. And I got to be honest, you know, we've got some some kiddos from all over the country tuning in, and uh, I'm I, I got I'm kind of enjoying it. There, there's something about um, tapping into you know the next generation virtually that um, it's not ideal, but uh, what what are you doing to spend your days uh, with the quarantine here, Coach? Well, uh, it, it has been an adjustment period, uh, I'll say. Um, fortunately, both me and my wife are still working, so that's that's been good. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of people are not, but to be able to initially have different waves of uh, a lot more question marks than answers. Not that we have it all figured out now, but uh, as it related to our players and what was going to happen with them, virtual learning versus in the classroom, some of them still sticking around in Providence. And so it's had its moment of just being incredibly busy. And then other times you're you're playing catch up. You're trying to work ahead for the unknown that you still are, are waiting for the others all, whenever that may be. But yeah. staying busy, reading a lot more. Um, I, I've been hanging pictures, <laughs> tapping the hammer to the nail a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's been good. Uh, I think there there's some things we talked about as staff early on. And it was, we're, we're not sure what we're going to be able to do, but we need to do whatever we're doing well. Mm -hmm. That's being at home, like two of my assistant coaches, and being on dad duty for 25 hours a day, then <laughs> they did that well. If we're um, yeah, if we're going to be here, let's, let's win. Huh? Right. Yeah. There's no, no showing up for a forfeit. Like, nope. That's, Exactly. Exactly. Well, I, I'm seeing some of my regulars to tune in. Sleepover is uh, his nickname. If you've got a nickname, uh, uh, comment in the comment section what your nickname is, folks. But we're here with the head coach of Brown University, Grant Achilles. Um, and, and let's just start right there, coach. I know you were on my podcast, but uh, it's the first thing I do with any kid at any camp that I coach is I I, I look them in the eye, I ask them what their name is, and then we figure out a nickname. Uh, do you have a nickname, Coach? I've never had a nickname. Oh, that's it's sad. Not, that's just sad. So I guess that's, that's partially true. I, I was 
was born on the 11th uh, of the month, uh, June 11th, and so I always wore number 11. So my teammates called me Sticks. Yep, Sticks. Yep. Patriot uh, Patriots 2K said automatic. Automatic. Did, did, uh, is that is that? I don't know if you know him <laughs> or not. That never happened, but I'll. I mean, I don't. I can't turn it down. Can't turn that down. That's a pretty good nickname. Um, yeah, we got Cameron in the house. We've got M9 Baseball. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, I really wanted to give these kids a sense of of what goes through a, a college baseball coach's mind, uh, specifically uh, when he's recruiting baseball players, because we've got a lot of middle schoolers, a lot of high schoolers. There's a couple Brown grads here that I played with as well. So maybe let's just start there. When you're in the recruiting process um, and you're seeing ball players all over the country, uh, what, what, what kind of names are you jotting down? What, what appeals to you? First and foremost, and it may sound a little crazy, but passion. Um, because when we're scouring the country for players and uh, the, the academic information, we'll find that out. There's not a lot of wiggle room with that. But, sure. Um, if a player has passion on the field and they make you take a second look, you're going to figure out a little bit more about their athleticism. You're going to figure out if they have the tools and the skills that you're recruiting and looking for that year. But if they don't have passion, the, the rest of it doesn't matter. I, I mean, because passion shows through when when the going gets tough. Passion shows through when it's 40 degrees and snowing. Yep. And passion shows through when you've had a rough day and get to that field. Yeah. So, that's what we look for. That's a great, a great starter, and you know, I, I, I can imagine as, as a coach, you're, you're looking for uh, the um, intangibles or maybe even the unteachables, things you can't really teach, and, and that's one of them, I think. Like as far as passion goes, you can really try to push a player uh, to, to give it their all. And I'm reading a book. This guy, he sure pushed his players. Tommy Lasorda, he, he was all about uh, the fire and the hard work, the, the work ethic and determination, but. Um, there is that innate, uh, from, from a, from a young kid, um, just that, 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 that sense of, yeah, I love something and I'm going to go after it a hundred percent that I just hadn't figured, I haven't figured out how to teach that, you know? So, uh, it's, it's nice when they show up and they've got that, that's a good, good starting point. So I always tell the kids at the Sandlot with your notebooks, write down something that, that um, speaks to you, and maybe that's the first thing, sleepover, water slide, M9 baseball, all my guys with nicknames here. Um, coaches are looking for passion, looking for passion. Uh, if you have to go number two down the list, what what's next as far as um, uh, trying to recruit a baseball player that you want on your team? Uh, well, you, uh, you said part of the word, team, teammate. Uh, you got to be a good teammate, and I think – that's that's broader than just the people that you're in the dugout with. Mm -hmm. uh, as as the head coach and as one of the staff, we're all on the team. I'm a teammate to the players, just in a different role. In, in a family setting, you're a teammate to your family members. So if the person has a good team, cohesive atmosphere, and good good teammate heart they're going to treat their mom and dad with respect. They're going to treat their teammates with respect. They're, they're going to treat the umpire with respect. And we, we have some core principles that we use as a team. And, um, it, it, the first one that we use is brotherhood. So on a team, any team, whatever it is, if there's another person, you've got a brotherhood and yep. sisterhood, man, it would just, we, we use brotherhood for us. Mm -hmm. That, that shows through quickly. Absolutely. That's great. Wolfie's in the house. Dylan's in the house. Sleepover. I see your thumbs up there. Uh, it's interesting talking to a Division One college baseball coach right now, and I've asked, what do you look for in, uh, in a recruit? Uh, home runs, throwing at 95. That has not come up yet in the first two, and I love that. And I've seen a, a lot of coaches the same exact way. Uh, one of my favorite lines in Tommy Lasorda's book is, I'll take a kid with determination over a kid with talent any day 
because everybody's got talent, but you have to have that determination and that character to make it to that next level. Um, that's really great. As far as my coaching, I really stand on three prongs. Um, and then I work with younger kids as opposed to, you know, high school and college with you, but, uh, it's all about character. I want them to become a better person and I want them to fall in love with the game. And again, the skills, uh, winning that stuff, it's third place. That's the third prong for me. Um, I'm interested to, to ask a guy that's seen so many high school players, so many middle school players come up. Uh, you coached at Wake Forest. Uh, now you're at Brown University. Um, but what's what has stood out to you that you can remember specifically at a tryout or at a camp where you're like, skill wise, I got to have that kid. Yeah, I, I think most of the time when we go through and there's a, a camp or a showcase, they typically have some organization, offensive, defensive, and then they'll, they'll run you around and play some games. Um, in the offensive setting, it's how many times can that, that player hit the ball on the barrel of the bat? Yeah. It may be pretty. It may not be the exact same swing. It, you'll see some athleticism, but offensively, it's just – get the barrel of the bat to the baseball. That's been a common theme for every guest I've had, major league players, coaches, uh, college coaches as well, just barrel to the ball. Uh, yeah. And that's uh, what can these kids do right now in the quarantine to work on that coach? How can they practice barrel to the ball uh, in their backyard or in their, in their basement? So I think there are a lot of really good things. And I picked up some, tremendous training tools when I've been, been visiting the Dominican Republic uh, and some of the stuff that they do is they'll take a, a broomstick handle that's sawed off. If it's too big for you, you choke up. If it's small, you just got to work with it. And they'll put some sunflower seeds in their mouth and they'll spit it out and they'll try to hit the sunflower seeds. That is great. And that means you got to control the, the sunflower seeds. And you got to have your head down on the baseball when you're swinging. That's great. Robinson Cano would do that in the on-deck circle. Uh, and I think Wilson Contreras does that as well. Very interesting. Uh, I, I love doing that as well. And I've told my kids to do that. So uh, if this is the second thing you're writing down, kids, sunflower seed batting practice and use anything you can. Um, I love that. Yeah, go ahead. You may not want to do that inside. Better do that outside. Good point. That, that's why you're an Ivy League coach, man. That's <laughs> um, so uh, as far as hitting goes, we got to get the barrel to the ball. Um, you, you see the passion first. You see the the selfless teammate second. And I'm guessing we start working towards the skills third, barrel to the ball. What else uh, stands out when you're at a camp, at a tryout, where I'm guessing that's where most of – your recruiting is, um, or maybe it's not, and we'll get to that in a second, but uh, what's another skill that, that stands out and, and you're like, yep, D1 material? Yeah, and, I, and I'll talk about the, the positioning of our uh, recruiting as well, but um, in terms of defense, uh, it's it, getting the baseball – and whatever your pocket size is, if it's a catcher's mitt, if it's an infielder's mitt, uh, an outfielder, basically just catch it. But catcher and infielder, I look for it to go in the same spot every time. I call it a clean pocket pop. Uh, and that's something a coach told me a long time ago. He said, look for a clean pocket pop because that means that the guy knows where it's going to hit. It's not going to rattle around a bunch. And you just get it there. That's interesting. Your teammate at Wake Forest, Matt Antonelli, same exact thing. He talked about using the tennis ball, tossing it up against the wall, and just making sure that it, it lands in the exact same spot in your finger. Very cool. Something I'd never really heard about until Matt said it, and now you've said it as well. Very interesting. So, kids, there's another one. How about number three? Work on finding that same spot wherever you're playing the position. Um, uh, something that really – stands out to me when I'm looking at a player for the first time is their feet. 
it's just their footwork, uh, depending on where they might be. Could be outfield, could be infield. I was an outfielder in college, so I'm always looking at that first step. Uh, I'm also looking at their 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 foundation, their base. Uh, where does that come into play for you as far as footwork goes um, when you're when you're watching and recruiting kids? Sure, that's a that's a great question. It's a big part of our uh, defensive evaluation for sure. Um, and in terms of the steps people take to the baseball, having them be aggressive, under control, and efficient. And when and you've probably used this in your teaching a bunch, I think I've seen it a couple times, but uh, as an infielder, when they approach the baseball, they want to approach it like an airplane and go gradually down instead of a helicopter where they go up and drop. Right. Uh, and that's, that's, all in your feet because you want to try to gain ground quickly with your feet together and closer you're going to gain more ground just like you're running you're going to try and run to the baseball under control but as you get closer to it you want to chop your feet break your steps down a little bit and then right left field right left throw Mm -hmm. And it's like a dance is what I tell the kids. And we, we worked on it yesterday at the Sandlot with Coach Owen Reed. Uh, he's a coach in Singapore, and uh, I, I found him on Instagram. He, he's been coaching over there for years, but um, we worked on a couple different drills, just footwork drills, right, left field, right, left throw, same thing um, with Coach Duke Baxter. So, guys, it, this is a common theme as far as – uh, defense goes just this footwork, this dance, and and being in control of your body. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. Talking a little bit about the rooting process, and and um, for me, I mean, and, and, and I think times have changed. You know, we're about the same age, so it, things have maybe changed from when we were getting recruited to when you're uh, recruiting kids now. Um, where are you finding your kids? And for this, this 13 year old on here right now, um, how can he be found? What, what, what is your advice for him? So my first word of advice is to be patient. You have time. (laughs) Um, every school, every program is different. Um, we joke that some colleges go to check out little league baseball just because of how intense it can seem at those games uh just be patient and have fun and play above all else when it comes to getting noticed by colleges i think it's every again everybody's different but uh it, it always helps for us to know that a player has interest in our program first and the school will will figure out if that's going to be a fit. Mm -hmm. Uh, If if there's not a fit with the school, but you really love our program, it's not going to work out. If there's a fit with the program, but you really love the school, it's not going to work out. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very unique circumstance that we need to find ourselves in. Now, in terms of getting noticed by coaches, um, that's usually something – Sophomore, junior year of high school, once you've developed and matured and, and who you are as a player is closer to who you'll be when you step foot on campus, that's when I feel at my best in terms of evaluating a player. Mm-hmm. Uh, so many things can change physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, just the style of play, I think, is very, very different and unique. Yeah. Um, individual. That's good. Uh, uh, wh- while you're still on that note, uh, M9 Baseball, what age should I start reaching out to coaches? Uh, and M9, maybe comment how old you are, but that, that is a good question. Uh, what would you say? Would you say it's that sophomore, junior year? Or? Yeah, and so there's a, there, there's some limitations in terms of when coaches can, can reach out and communicate with players. Uh, and we're technically not supposed to communicate with players until junior year. Um, it's September 1st, I believe. They change, they change the rules every couple of years now just to adapt with what's going on. Um, but once once you reach that September 1st cutoff, or it may be July 1st now, um, that's when we can actually respond. Mm-hmm. Players reaching out, it's, you know, when you're in high school, you can, you can start reaching out. Just don't 
don't set too high of expectations in terms of who's going to be reaching out back to you. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's a that's a very valid question and, and one that you know parents and players don't get a ton of education on. It's it true. Yeah. Good. It's good. It's good. I mean, I I we did we just kind of went flying as far as my recruiting process goes. And my dad, uh, uh, he would <laughs> whenever I would have a good game, he would send those newspaper clippings to every college coach. Um, but for me. I had a decision to make. Uh, I got seen when I was in um, when I was in eleventh grade. I got seen by a Brown coach, and the Brown program was the one that seemed the most interested in me, or the 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 place that I thought I could maybe start. So uh, that's my advice when kids ask me that. Um, you, I was passionate about Brown because they were passionate about me, and it worked both ways. I, uh, some of the other schools. You know, it, it seemed like maybe I would get redshirted or maybe I'd, I'd get a starting job sophomore year, but I knew there was a valid chance to start. And that's a big part for me. And um, so if you want to play all four years, then 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 go for that school and let that school know once you're a sophomore, junior. And hey, my I mean, my dad, he's, he's watching on YouTube right now. But uh, our coach back when I was there said, your dad, he would send. Every single weekend, every single week, he would send what what kind of things you were doing. So I'm sure you get newspaper clippings as well. But um, at the end of the day, you got to show them you're interested, like you said. So um, keep knocking on their door, and and uh, that's that's our advice to you, M9. Anybody else who has some questions? I mean, this is a D1 college baseball coach, Grant Achilles, my good friend, and uh, he'll he'll answer some questions as far as you can, transparency wise. Uh, can you let us in on on NCAA or what's going on? Uh, seniors eligibility. Is there anything you can let us in on uh, behind the curtain? Sure. Yeah. It, it's it's been gosh, it, it's been a tough process for everyone involved, and it's going to have a ripple effect. Um, uh, our players, when they initially found out that our season was canceled, there again so many, so many questions uh, that we just didn't have the answers to. Um, the NCAA came out pretty quickly and said, "We feel like it's it it should be something where each player that lost this spring should get this year back." Since then, uh, they've released a, a slew of um, rulings and judgments and decisions to try and come up with each case scenario, but each player that missed out on this spring from a college perspective gets this year of eligibility back. So what that means is um, you're, you're going to see a lot of players that are going to graduate and go and work on a graduate degree. Um, to try and get something done. There's some roster implications for schools. There are some uh, financial implications in terms of scholarships, but you're going to see a lot more players extend into a fifth year than you normally would. Um, a, a, another factor that's impacting this is the Major League Baseball draft, which is typically 40 rounds is probably going to be 10 rounds. Yeah. So a lot of high, uh, college seniors that would have gotten taken, uh, a lot of college juniors that would have gotten taken, junior college players and high school players, that draft class is now whittled down drastically. So we're going to see a lot of players either staying in school or going to school. Mm -hmm. uh, would have otherwise started a professional career. Yeah, and I've seen you've been you've been posting on Twitter some of the seniors who've uh, lost this season. Um, they're going to a different uh, program and getting that last year of eligibility in. I think that's great. Um, I mean, this has been tough for everybody. You know, it's been tough for the Little Leaguers. The Little League World Series just got canceled. It's been tough for me. It's been tough for you, at, for all of us. Uh, just take us inside that that locker room uh, when you had to tell the seniors, you had to tell the team. Um, uh, what what was what was the silver lining there, or did you find one? Uh, what what? Uh, how are you pumping those guys up? Yeah, and it, 
this year was a year that we had hoped for very, very big things. Uh, the senior class had been party to, as freshmen, guys like Rob Henry, who you mm-hmm. had on. Yeah. Uh, and just seeing some really special players come before them. And they were really special players themselves because of the players that uh, they had been around and learned from. And freshmen through senior class, we all had that expectation. But when you go into that locker room after having a conversation that says, all right, yeah, it's done. (laughs) And for some of these guys, again, you don't know if it's going to be the last time they ever suit up in a uniform again. But try to talk positivity about instead of mourning and spending too much time in that mourning because it, it is good to grieve the loss. It's good to to validate those emotions and feelings instead of sweeping them under the rug. Um, but instead of camping out there, to just be grateful for the time that we have mm-hmm. um, had together. Gratitude is another big word that we we speak on in one of our core principles, and um, just gratitude that we were able to play this spring. Um, so at that point, just being honest, uh, candid with what I knew, and saying, guys, whatever happens, like you have all been a member of this Brown family, and you will always be a member of this Brown family. Mm-hmm. Go Bruno, go Bruno. I um, I keep I keep something from the Brown family right here, and I look at it as much as I can. This is my Cliff Stevenson Award. Uh, very very proud of this puppy right here uh, for leadership. When when I saw this award given out my junior year, I looked at the coach and I said, "I'm winning that award. I'm winning that thing next year. Uh, what do I have to do?" And um, that coach's name was Coach Raphael Serrato. And uh, he really helped me get that uh, because um, uh, I was a a senior that had to really turn things around. I had a bad junior year as a captain, and I had to figure out uh, how to change things up with my swing. And he, um, without getting paid extra money, he showed up 30 minutes early every day and threw me early BP. Um, and, and when I walked into his office to ask him if he would do that, I kind of thought, well, he'll get paid overtime or <laughs> he'll get some extra money or something. No, I was just a, you know, a 22 year old, um, dumb, dumb. I didn't, I didn't know anything about the world. So, uh, but he did it and it was one of the best lessons I ever got. Uh, and he didn't even say anything. It's just what he did. He, he without, without even, uh, an ounce of negativity. He did it. He put down what he had and he went and he threw BP to me in the cage 30 minutes before every uh, practice. And it's su- such a great lesson. I kind of want to hear, you know, I-, I love asking this question to all coaches. Uh, you know, what was the best advice you ever got from a coach? Might've been a teammate. Uh, do you have, do you have some, some pearls in there? Yeah, there were, there were some, hard moments for me. Uh, it, I, I think for every player that ascends to the next level where you start to question question yourself and doubt yourself. And uh, it, in my mind at that time, the best player on our team at Wake Forest told me, you know, he said, you belong. If you didn't belong, you wouldn't be here. Mm. Like, Whatever happened before, whatever's going to happen, just always know you belong. And for me, that that really spoke into some confidence that I had forgotten how to have. Mm-hmm. And it, it, he said, don't try to be who you're not. Like the guys over there that are hitting home runs every swing, that's not who you are. Right. Be the best version of yourself that you can be. That's great. That's a really good one. I, I you, you tapped into a word that is a major theme of, of baseball and sports in general, and that's confidence. Um, uh, have, you, have you been around or, or coached a player that, uh, that has got that groove, that's in that groove, and you know it's, it's based in confidence? And if so, um, 
can you teach that or can you pin pinpoint exactly where that stemmed from that that word confidence it's just a biggie and um, uh, help help us wrap our brains around that word so we can have it more when we're in the batter's box sure yeah I, I believe the confidence that to me comes from continuing to repeat something over and over and over and over again and then throwing in another outside factor that you can't control and trying to continue to repeat it mm. because especially in our sport so many things happen outside of your control and there's so much perceived negativity that we can have impact us uh, and a guy like Steve Springer uh, talks about quality of bats. I know Rob mentioned them. Uh, he is one example of many people that helps helps you redefine success in your mind. And I'm not talking about lying to yourself to make yourself feel better. I'm talking about looking at okay, what was within my control? What can I do to repeat that better? The same way every single time out. Mm -hmm. I, I think confidence does have a physical component to it, but there's so much mentally that you have to get through to, to be able to have that confidence to know whether or not you failed or succeeded in this moment. I've done this thing hundreds and thousands of times before. Yep. So that's, this moment is the only moment that matters. I love that. That's really good. Uh, you know, just just packing in the the um, the paperwork uh, in your in your baseball notebook with practice and building to that that curriculum, and then you you just have that in your back pocket. You can throw it in the trash can once the game starts and when the umpire says play ball. But that that definitely gives me confidence. Something that also gave me, uh, I think, mental. Uh, toughness to have the confidence in the downtimes was other sports, football. Um, just ha just just playing, uh, just playing with different types of coaches, playing with different types of people in different games, different types of sports. It really helped me out when I was zero for twenty. Uh, just just knowing, hey, I um, uh, I, I this this weight trainer that I had in high school uh, football. Uh, he really gave me a nice life lesson on on mental toughness and strength. So um, I'm a big fan of multiple sports. We've got we've got a couple questions here. I know you're a big fan of multiple sports, but um, I, I want to get to to. Uh, I'm not graduating Global Freeze, <laughs> but I am going to be Jim Nance at four o'clock uh, for a golf um, for a golf trivia contest. Here's a good one. Should you play travel ball or recreation ball before high school? Um, uh, I'll give you the floor, and then I'll have I'll have something to piggyback on that. But yeah, travel ball is a big uh, it's a big thing, and and there, there's there's pros and cons. But hey, you're a college baseball coach, uh, you can answer that. Should you play travel ball or rec ball before high school? Uh, you can stop that sentence at you should play. I mean, I, I, for me, I, I think they're really good teams that don't leave their city. Mm -hmm. And they're really bad teams that play all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, just just play as, as often as you can. Try to learn from the game as much as you can. Uh, it, I played Legion Ball and my, my travel team – was two high schools that we didn't really have a chance to play together much because we were playing against each other. Mm -hmm. And ended up um, just a, having a team that was formed by a couple of the dads. And it, we were all very successful. I mean, mo most of us went on to play college baseball. And we paid very little to do it. And I understand cost is a, an issue for a lot of people and will only continue to be an issue, uh, but just play. It's, it's great. And, and I, I, can, I can say that now, more than back when we were trying to get recruited, it's an even better time to just play because 
there's that dad in that legion uh, bleachers in Idaho with an iPhone that films you hitting that triple to right center, and that gets posted on Instagram, and the Brown University baseball coach sees it because I reposted it. So uh, just play. the. Uh, I think the passion that you play with, uh, it's going to shine through every little iPhone camera. So the passion, which you talked about first, just having that passion, that's your, that's your A number one. That's what you see first. Uh, being a great teammate, uh, and then just play. Just play whatever baseball you can. Uh, Rowan Wick, who's a major league pitcher, he was on the sandlot for the Cubbies, uh, said the same thing. He's like, if you're a player, you will get seen. It might be in JUCO. It might be an independent ball. It might be when you're a junior in high school, but you'll get seen. You will get your shot, um, but it's really up to you to, to have that love and that passion. So, um, again, man, I just keep looking at this guy right here, you know, Mike Piazza, the guy who nobody wanted, uh, but he saw something in Mike Piazza and he just kept driving him, keep showing up, keep showing up. Uh, and then, you know, rookie of the year and MVP. Uh, it's very good. Very good. Uh, any other questions you kids have before we let coach go? He's got a baby on the way. He's got a baby coming soon. Um, M9, M9 Baseball is 14-year-old. He's, he's got an Instagram account. He's trying to inspire kids to work harder and spread positivity. I love it. I've seen some of the videos, M9, and we got to come up with a good nickname for you. Uh, but in this day and age, um, what are some uh, creative things these kids can be doing, um, like you said, not only to get exposure, but to spread some positivity and, uh, and, 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 and show – uh, that they can be a good teammate, show that they have passion. And, and, and kind of be that good teammate is either pick an example of somebody who wasn't a good teammate to you and promise to never be that person to anyone else. That will immediately help shift the focus from yourself to someone else. Mm -hmm. And conversely, if somebody else really was a good teammate to you, Look for ways to be that guy to another a guy or girl to another teammate, sure. and that's that's a really positive way. Uh, I think a good thing to remember is that if if you are a, a good teammate, you don't have to show people. People will find people will know, um, and at the end of the day, it, it shows when. I mean, gosh, it, you go to a game, and if a guy strikes out, and Nobody says anything to him, period. The guy's probably got some issues with his teammates. Mm -hmm. If the only time people come up to you is when things are going well, that's probably showing some issues with teammates. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if somebody else is carrying your bag consistently, be a better teammate to mom and dad. They showed up and watched you. They dropped you off and took you back and forth. Be a good teammate to mom and dad. Yeah, that's what a ball player does. I, I, I'm, I'm uh, preaching that uh, all day long. This is great, man. We could talk baseball forever. I, I, uh, I don't want to keep you too long, but Knott's Berry Farm, uh, Alfredo, Cheetah, Captain Clutch, Sleepover, all my sandlotters. If you have any questions for Coach Grant Achilles, he's the uh, head baseball coach of Brown University Bears. We'll, we'll keep him another couple minutes here. Uh, before we let him go, um, what, what's one of your favorite moments uh, that you can recall on a baseball field, player, coach, whatever? Um, well, anything stand out? Uh, um, as a player, for me, it, it, it's probably my first collegiate hit. Mm. Uh, it, it happened my junior year. <laughs> How about that? Uh, I was, I think, 0 for 19 with no stars, just a bunch of pitch hit at bats. And we were down one, or I'm sorry, it was tied. And I ended up uh, getting to pinch hit, came in, and I, I hit a home run. And that was my first collegiate hit. So that moment, that's actually, I got a picture on the wall that some of my, my best friends and buddies 
they put put it together for me, and it's me being at home plate. I've got some, some of my closest friends just surrounding me there. That that was short of winning the championship. That was my my best moment um, as a player, and then as a coach, I'll never forget. There, it was my first year coaching. And talking about the passion, we we were a very good team that year, UNC Charlotte, and um, we actually never lost one. I mean, we never lost back to back games the Ooh. entire. And there was a moment where our ace was pitching, and he gave up some runs. He wasn't sharp. They were they were doing a good job. He comes in. And he says, they're not scoring off of me again. Score some runs so we can win. And it was that just collective moment where it wasn't rah-rah. It wasn't everybody getting up and being loud for the sake of being loud. It was, okay, we got a job to do. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. And they did it. <laughs> yeah. So, that was a pretty cool moment to step into as a 23-year-old first-year coach. Absolutely. That's so good. Oh, that's such a good feeling. I mean, that's such a good feeling as a player. I kind of had that uh, as a player at Brown. Uh, we beat, uh, I believe it was a big Harvard game where we, nope, we swept Dartmouth. It was game four uh, Dartmouth, and we swept them uh, with a big a big four-game sweep. But um, I can only imagine as a coach just how proud that feeling is to – um, to have that, man, we, uh, we're going to have to have you on again, brother. We'll have to talk some more baseball, but you've got uh, more important things going on. Uh, when is that baby due? When, when is, when is baby Achilles coming? Uh, well, um, the official due date, which uh, my wife, Elizabeth has actually joined the chat. E Dalgan. At a girl, at a girl. E Dalgan, that's a that's a that's a the best handle of the day, by the way. <laughs> Dalgan, I was I was grateful that she that she transitioned to Achilles. Dalgan was her last name. So. I know that's a good one. That's tough. Yeah. So uh, May eighteenth is the official due date, uh, and the way I told, told some of my um, my friends when they check in, it's we're in the any day mindset right now. Yeah. So, uh, bags are packed, got the outfits ready. We watched Father of the Bride Part 2. So. <laughs> well, let me know if you need uh, um, the five S's because that, uh, that's a, that was a big one for us, just trying to get the baby to calm down. and uh, Oh, man, the, the shaking and the shushing. and It's a whole deal, man. It's a whole deal. Yeah. You said five S's. I know, right? Yeah, there's so many. Um, well, awesome, man. This has been great. For my Sandlotters, again, this has been a really cool treat. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and uh, Coach Achilles, thanks for spending some time with us here at the Sandlot. Uh, we got to give him an attaboy from all over the world, Global Freeze, Will Francis, Caitlin Lutz, one, two, three, attaboy. Coach Ball Game, attaboy. Hope you felt that. That's it. And and add a girl to E. Dalgan. Uh, you guys keep in touch and keep us posted, but uh, all the best to you. Will do. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Go yeah, on. buddy. You got it. All right, coach. Bye-bye. Bye. Very cool. So I shared that to the Instagram live. Um, and then we've got golf trivia coming up in 17 minutes with one of the funniest guys I've ever met. So, um, tune into Instagram live for the, the two trivia contests coming up at four and five Pacific.